Isn't God good? Yes, praise God. Thank you for the welcome. May the Lord richly bless you. Being in the house of the Lord tonight, sharing in the fellowship and worship unto God Almighty, how that we've been encouraged and edified. Praise be to Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 If that was disturbing, get used to it. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There was a couple of guys who said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. What happened? He jumped up, praised God, went into the temple, leaping and praising God throughout the whole area, and people, some went this way and some went that way. Amen. Things happen when the Lord is on the scene. Things happen when we believe Him and trust Him. Things happen when we dare to believe. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me give you just a little excerpt of the message this morning. Have you seen a ghost? The disciples thought they saw a spirit walking on the water. And later they were disappointed in themselves. And Jesus made the comment, or the comment was made, about how that they had so quickly forgotten the miracles that had just happened, just hours prior to, to this occasion. I want to share something with you tonight that we all heard. No one was guilty that I know of, but notice how the devil works. Would you please pray for Kevin? We prayed. The doctor says, don't hit your head. Don't hit your head. Three or four days later, whomp, down he went, hit his head. In that moment, here's my point. In that moment, what happened to Rose? What happened to uh, Dorothy? What happened to the family? Somebody be honest. What happened to them? <laughs> they were tempted, for sure. <gasps> <gasps> and that's a normal reaction, but what happens after that is what we need to embrace and understand. What was the report tonight? <laughs> Look what God can do for us if we're not moved by the ghost we see and we experience. Amen. It was such a joy to hear that tonight. Now, here's one more comment, and then we get into the message. Several times we've heard tonight about today's service Wednesday night last Sunday service that's all well and good and wonderful what's liable to happen in the next few days a ghost will appear and whatever situation circumstance that the devil presents it to be amen you'll be tempted to go ah. but if you'll remember what happened today what God has done for us all our life we need not be moved past the initial <gasps> walking through the grass and we look down and see a snake. What happens? Ah! In the moment, that's normal. But if we start agitating and configuring and dissecting and oh, oh, things gets worse and worse and worse, you start sinking. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Etc. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to the book. Or letter, it's called a letter, an epistle of Titus. Epistle of Paul to Titus. It's a letter. I'm going to be preaching on the letter of Titus tonight. Not the whole thing, it's going to be condensed. But I appreciate the Lord's presence tonight. I feel so much better than I did when I come to church tonight, knowing, knowing that God's presence and blessing will succeed in my life. Amen. Didn't feel well at all. Ooh, much better now. Hallelujah. Defeat is one word I'll never use. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence and your power, your faithfulness, how that you're diligent to uh, be in control of your plan, how that we can realize and recognize and expect your promises to be real and valid in those who will trust and believe and be patient. 
Thank you, Father, for your exploits this, this Lord's day and many times prior, and that you'll continue, and those that will believe and trust you will experience those blessings and that power and blessing in our hearts and lives. Father, help us now, Lord, to believe and receive your word as we hear the truth that you're providing this evening in its entirety. That I ask that you'd help me present it, provide it in a way pleasing to you, that your will be accomplished. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for the testimonies, the songs, the blessing, the ministry of your spirit tonight to encourage us and strengthen us once again. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Somebody say godliness. Is that in your life? Is it supposed to be in your life? Do you welcome godliness in your life? Do you uh, reject it? Do you excuse for it? Is godliness in your life? In hope of eternal life. Do we have eternal life now? What is it? It's a hope. It's a hope. We don't have it. It's based on faith. It's a hope. That's all great and good. There's nothing to fear or doubt or be backward about. That's an absolute valid promise that God has given us. We accept that promise through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a hope. Hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Praise God. What a wonderful, marvelous, uh, substantiated introduction that Paul has written this letter uh, to Titus, acknowledging him, establishing the promise of Jesus Christ, our eternal life through Jesus Christ according to the common faith, or the normal faith that we would have to accept salvation in Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. This letter has to do with setting things in order, having to do with making sure that things are done godly, uh, in the spirit and as God would desire and purpose in our hearts and lives. I asked you a question a moment ago, is there godliness in your life? There is, but what to, to, to what extent is godliness in your life? Well, if it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't. Shame on you. Amen. We're purposed. We are purposed. We are purposed to live in a manner to honor God, serve him. Doesn't make our salvation any greater. Does it make us uh, get to heaven any quicker? What it does is the representation of who we are as ambassadors of Christ to be the right impression or the impression that the Spirit would do in and through our lives. He's saying to Titus, set up elders, make sure things are in order concerning the church. And there's a reason, verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped. Anybody that misrepresents the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be stopped. Amen. Say or do something or you'll be the guilty one. You remember the verse in the Old Testament? It's been a long time since I've read it and looked it up. Uh, how's it said? I don't even remember now. Uh, blood on our hands, some, something along that line. Guess what? We'll be guilty if you don't do or say something in his name. For his name's sake. For his purpose to be accomplished in our lives. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. In other words, they got their uh, pocket filled because of what they're doing. Folks are liking it. Look at our world today of how many people are making a lot of money because they're telling something that's not truth, but people are liking it. Isn't it miserable? Isn't it, isn't it awful that things like that are going on? It's just absolutely astronomical of the ugliness that's going on in our world. And a lot of the ugliness is real close to us. Real close to us. Verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. We don't need to be guilty of what this verse is talking about. We need to be in a position and do and behave that the, the things that we do and say are not abominable, detestable, ugly, want to go away from, to reject and, and abandon. 
It also says not to deny Him and to be disobedient. Every one of us are subject to being disobedient if we're not careful because we'll put it off to a more convenient time. We may not think it in those terms. We may not say it in those terms, but that's what we do because other things are on our agenda. Amen. How long does it take to pray? Generally, not real long. And it's not that you have to pray a long prayer. It's not that praying a short prayer is good enough all the time. Does the Lord ask you to pray about something and you put it off? Maybe more times than we should. Amen. The scripture is saying here, uh, uh, Paul is saying to Titus, say and establish and promote the gospel so that people become uh, not disobedient, but become obedient. To trust God and believe God. And to every good work. What is good work? Things you do to obey God. It's all in that one verse right there. Things you do to obey, obey God is a good work. What's reprobate mean? Dull, senseless, numb. Let's not become that way. I don't think we have a serious problem, but who, who likes reminders? I like reminders. I want to be urged by the Spirit every day to live in holiness and godliness. That's the status we're in. That's a calling we're in. We don't produce it. We live it because who's in us? For his name's sake, for his purpose. Uh, Paul told Titus, set things in order. There's a reason there's people out there teaching and preaching and promoting things that's not right. Folks are falling for it. Amen. Chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Will you hear this? Speak things that become of sound doctrine. What's that mean, pastor? That's this. It's very simple. Don't add. Don't take away. Think about that. There's some folks in here can use this and need to hear this. Don't add nor take away. Say what the doctrine says. The doctrine is simply a teaching, something that we learn. It's a doctrine concerning this, that, and the other. He says, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Not what somebody experienced or what grandpa said or what I would love for it to be. Simply say what the word of God. Then you're not accountable for anything that's wrong. Amen. I know this is not a shouting, uh, running the aisles kind of uh, uh, message, but it's truth and it's powerful and it makes you free if you believe and trust what it has to say. That becomes sound doctrine that the aged men, here's another directive, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, Sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Those of you that consider yourself younger, look to the older who is qualified in this area to let them be your example. Those of us that are older, I consider myself older, not old, but older, aged to some extent, to be sober, clear-minded, grave, serious, temperate, self-control, sound in faith, uh, uh, diligent and and uh, 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 faithful in charity in patience any man that's past their youth and become aged that's not anywhere close to what this is talking about who calls himself a christian needs to learn some things amen needs to, why why because there's ugliness teaching out there there's mis- misrepresentation out there that we're in a position to promote the gospel to promote what's right and truthful so that people hear and are impressed or moved by the Spirit in the right way. Notice what it goes on to talk about. The aged women. Now, I'll be courteous enough not to say, how many of you women are aged? (laughs) There's more in here than you believe or will want to believe. Just because you're 60 plus doesn't necessarily you're the only one aged. What does aged mean? That means matured experienced. There's some in here that's below 50. You're aged with what this is talking about. Well, if you've known the Lord a considerable amount of time and you've had opportunity to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you're in a position to be aged. In other words, matured, capable, perfected. Amen. Listen to the role you have, men and women. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Ladies, those of you that are less than aged, qualify as being immature, not perfected. It's not an excuse not to try to be holy. 
There's not an excuse not to try to live in godliness because somebody's impressing you or inspiring you to be holy and godly. Amen. There are, and you know them. They're an example. Paul was an example. Titus was an example, et cetera, et cetera. We have examples here today and tonight. There's a purpose and plan why we need to pay attention to what the truth is. I know we already know it, but we need to be reminded because there's a purpose. There's ugliness out there that's going rampant, of falsehood, false teaching, so forth and so on. A lot of people are falling for it. We need to simply stick to what the simple truth says, no more, no less. Uh, be holy, not false accusers. Ladies, and I'll include the men, don't be yapping about people that you don't know anything about. Don't be drawing your conclusion because what you see in here and you've got it all figured out and you yap, 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 yap. Don't do that. You're slapping holiness and godliness in the face, thinking you have credence to do such a thing. Amen. Just don't do it. If you're just got to do something, pray for them. And most likely, if you have to muster up that kind of willpower, you're going to have to ask the Lord to forgive you in the first place. Amen. So you can make some tracks. Uh, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, clear-minded, to love their husbands. You see? <clears throat> well, I won't get into that. To love their children. To be discreet. Discreet. <laughs> no more, no less. Ladies, young women, and the men could be included too. Be discreet. Say no more than what's necessary. Say no more than what's necessary. Because if you go beyond what's necessary, you fester. Seeds go out and it comes up and you'll have to deal with it. And you won't be able to handle it. You won't be able to handle it. Okay. Be discreet. Chase keepy, uh, keepers at home. Good. Obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God. Here's the reason. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Ladies, do your best to obey, do your best to trust, do your best to be a, a wife like you should, so the word of God won't be what? Blaspheme. That's a serious, uh, aggressive terminology. Ladies, just because your husband don't do what you think they ought to doesn't give you right to fly off the handle. When you do, guess what's blasphemed? Amen. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm simply giving you what the Lord gave me. And it took me a while, I'll just be honest. It took me a while to get to where I'm at because I looked and looked and studied and studied, uh, dealing with how I was feeling earlier. It was tough. I seriously thought about, let's pass tonight, Lord. I'm going to go find a desert place and relax and eat something. But it wound up with this. Praise God. All right, let's move along. Uh, young men, likewise, likewise what? What we just got through hearing. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. There it is again. A pattern of good works, something that somebody can follow, somebody that can be inspired by, something that would lead them in the right way. Of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. What's that mean? That means when you hear a young boy, a young man, who says something that's out of line with the Word of God, you're in line to be condemned, reprimanded, put on the carpet, etc. That's the truth. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters, uh, to please them well in all things, not answering again. In other words, don't, what do you call it, talk back. Not purloining, embezzling, but shewing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine, adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. In other words, put on the whole Word of God, the whole armor of God, the Word of God, the truth, nothing more, nothing, nothing less. Amen. Pastor, this is an awfully big bite to bite off and chew. I know. I know. There's been a few bites that I've bitten off of whatever, sandwich or whatever, and I'm thinking before I took a bite, that's too big, that's too big. And a few times I was right. That was too big. If we'll stick with it and trust God with what he's asking and leading and guiding us to do, you'll find favor, you'll find blessing, you'll find strength. 
In all things it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. This is one of the most powerful two or three verses here in the whole Bible. The grace of God. We love the grace of God. We desire the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, etc. The grace of God teaches us. Uh, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. You know, we're to live godly. Anything that comes into our life that's not godly called ungodliness, we're to reject that, refuse it. Don't partake. Don't yield to it. Don't be tempted and fall prey to the devil's tactics. Amen. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's our call. That's our status. That's who we are. That's the benefit and privilege that we have to serve and represent God in godliness and holiness and other things that we can include. The grace of God teaches us this. Then it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We heard tonight, looking forward to the sound of the trumpet, looking forward to the time that we're changed. Expect the time to come at any moment, any given time. Have that hope real and alive in your life. Not just something that kind of passes through your minds that, oh yeah, well that'll happen someday. And we go on uh, eating our hot dogs and uh, shooting our gun and uh, running our four-wheeler and uh, buying three pairs of shoes and uh, bad-mouthing a neighbor and run through Sonic five times a day. I'm just playing a scenario of what we're used to doing. And those things in themselves aren't necessarily wrong unless we forget what God says to do and to be. Amen. The, the grace of God teaches us, looking forward to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify in himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, zealous to obey the Lord, zealous to serve God, zealous to represent him, zealous to be a light and inspiration that many find deliverance and find salvation in Christ our Lord and serve him faithfully. These things speak and exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Stand your ground, not with arrogance, not with selfishness, but with the platter, the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the whole armor of God. You'll find success in the kingdom. That doesn't mean that everything is going to be easy. Doesn't mean everybody's wanting to listen to you, hear what you have to say, and invite you every day. Doesn't mean that with everything. What it means, we have an opportunity to serve and represent the Lord in the time and hour that we're living in. Verse 1 of chapter 3, I'm past halfway done. Somebody praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Doesn't mean I'm going to be done half the time. Chapter 3, put them in mind, Paul tells Titus, put them in mind to be subject to principalities, powers to obey, magistrates, to be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Anybody used to be foolish? Every one of us was because the Bible just said it, that we were. It's sad that too many are continuing to be foolish. That means knowing you're making the wrong decision. Knowing that you're disobeying. Knowing that you're misrepresenting. Foolish. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost." which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Such excitement, such joy, such expectation and potential that we have in our life to live and serve the Lord faithfully unto good works unto his precious name because of the hope that we have. Hope that's not alive is dead. Amen. We have a lively hope, Peter says, the hope of eternal life. What does eternal life have for us? Everything that we're not used to yet. We have a hope of it. What kind of life do we have now in this life? <sighs> do I need to tell you? Full of this, full of that, 
full of this, full of that. It's out there. We're touched with it. We're in, in the midst of it, etc. But we've given, been given a promise of life, a hope of eternal life with Jesus Christ forever and ever. But until we pass from this life, our body changed and our presence is with him forever and ever, there's something that we need to be responsible to. We need to be accountable to, and I've been talking to, to you a little bit about it this evening. It's called godliness. It's called holiness. It's called faithfulness. It's called good works. The things that we need to be involved in to represent the Lord and serve Him. So that what we do inspires others to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. To become closer to Him. Find that power in the Holy Ghost. The ministry of His Spirit to change people's lives. Amen. <clears throat> Just about finished. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Amen. What does that verse say? This is a faithful saying. I don't know how long this letter is. Didn't, it didn't count up all the verses or the words or anything, but it's not a very long letter. But as a pointed, it is, an, it is a pointed letter that Paul sent to Titus to set up certain things, to put things in order, to remind the reason and the purpose of doing this, to exhort one another, to proclaim the gospel in its verity and truth, and to live in holiness and righteousness and godliness. This is a faithful saying, Paul says. These things I will that thou affirm constantly. Don't water it down. Don't ask a bunch of questions like the next verse is talking about. Don't try to misrepresent. Don't try to uh, uh, allow certain things when you know better. Just don't do that. Be upfront. Some people won't like it. Some people will walk away. Would you rather things be like they are and, and be questionable and, uh, what was the word a while ago, blasphemy? Amen. Don't want to risk that because God is not pleased in those things. Uh, affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Amen. Our livelihood, our behavior, our representation in the kingdom of God is something that God is depending on. The Father's not here. Jesus isn't here. The Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, is here to help us be like Jesus was. Amen. No one understand the Word of God is what we need. It is God's power, His authority, with the anointing of the Spirit of God in our presence that we can be just like Jesus. He's expecting, He told His disciples, do the works as I did. And even more, when I go to the Father, when He went to the Father, the Holy Ghost came and we're empowered. and We have that authority if you'll believe that. And live in a manner as Jesus did. There's times of difficulty. There's times that we consider, Lord, let this cup pass for me, but... I'll not use the word defeat. I'll go forward. I'll trust God and believe God. Anyone need prayer tonight?